Adventures of Irving Man. Yes, it's Irving Man, strange visitor from California who came to Tacoma with powers and abilities far beyond ordinary YouTubers. Irving Man, who can change the most innocuous statement into a dumb joke, still lives in his childhood with his old TV shows, and who, disguised as Irving J. Funkemeyer, fights a never-ending battle for laughter, music, and ad revenue. Remember what I said last time about familiar faces? There's one of them right there, our pal Ben Weldon. The guy on the phone is Duke, the boss. He's calling the Daily Planet. I understand you plan to investigate a certain munitions operation. Never mind who this is. Just take a little advice. Lay off. Unless you want the Daily Planet to suffer one of the worst disasters in newspaper history. Look, we've been threatened over a thousand times. It's never stopped us before. All right, Kent, if that's the way you want it. The third guy in the room, the one who doesn't look like a stereotype gangster, has created some kind of a something that is supposed to utterly destroy the planet building. A balloon, a radio directional receiver, and a bottle of super nitroglycerin. Sort of a junior guided missile, huh? Not so junior. When this thing goes off, I want to be a long way in some other direction. <laughs> you do realize that without a setup a lot more elaborate than that, it's practically impossible to steer a balloon? The plan is to put that whole mess together and float it over to the planet where it'll detonate and take out just about everything. While they're musing over that, Clark is getting another call. That uh, was a Mrs. Taylor. She lives at 64 Hope Street, and she claims she saw a weird iron monster prowling around a house. Just for something to do, Lois and Jimmy will go check it out. Lois says that address sounds familiar anyway. Well, Professor Pepperwinkle, you remember us. I do. Sure. This is Miss Lane. I'm Jimmy Olson. We're from the Daily Planet. Oh, of course, of course. Well, come in, I suppose. That explains why the address sounded familiar. Last episode, he showed up at the planet with his anti-memory spray, which turned out to be an ideal tool for bank robbers to get away with their crimes. According to Mrs. Taylor, this week he's in league with metal aliens or something. They start telling him about the report they got, and he's acting strange. Mr. McTavish, uh, come out, McTavish. <laughs> Mr. McTavish is your basic super strong robot tuned to respond only to the professor's voice. So why a robot? You see, I'm a lonely old man and I built him to keep me company. And he's really very good company. He's, he's very helpful. He likes to putter around the yard and uh, oh dear, I'm, I'm afraid that's what got us into trouble. Get one of these. Cheaper, easier to maintain and much more cuddly. But if you simply must go with a robot, I suggest next time you put a voice module in him so at least you can have a conversation. Anyone can talk with him uh, through this. Uh, try it, Miss Lane. It converts your voice to the same frequency as mine. I think you mean talk to him. Talk with him sort of implies that he might talk back. Meanwhile, Mrs. Taylor is back on the phone. You want Superman to try and find the monster? Well, Mrs. Taylor, I mean... Well, the air might do me good at that. I mean, um, I'll, uh, I'll just see what I can do, Miss Taylor. He'll change and head over there, much like Lois and Jimmy. He figures it's something to do besides sitting around here waiting for something to pop. It's hard enough to keep a secret, let alone a secret like Mr. McTavish. If people weren't only so automatically frightened by things they don't understand. How much is that weirdo in the window? We don't need to ponder what he's doing there. He rents a room from Mrs. Taylor. Isn't it amazing how divergent things like that sometimes just come together in a series of remarkable coincidences? But our man there, today his name is Blade, is going to get more of an eyeful than he bargained for. Superman! What are you doing here? Please, Superman, I really haven't done anything wrong. So there really is a monster. 
Superman. What's the matter? Only one thing can do that to him. While he makes a hasty exit, Lois and Jimmy start probing. Have you ever heard of kryptonite? Kryptonite? kryptonite. No, I don't believe so. That's it, Miss Lane. Kryptonite. It's the only thing in the world that could weaken Superman. What's well, almost killed him a couple of times. Well, I don't understand. Well, it's a special element from the planet Krypton. That's where Superman comes from. And there must be some of it right here in this room. More precisely, it's in Mr. McTavish. A chunk of meteorite the professor found somewhere along the way is the key component in his friend's power supply. It's also what gives Mr. McTavish his incredible strength. Not the servo motors that operate his limbs or any of that stuff. It all comes from the kryptonite. Because science. Well, that's it, Duke. You mean it's all set? I mean it's as far as I can go with it. The balloon is zeroed in electronically on Kent's office in the planet building. Okay, hook it onto the balloon and let it go up the skyline. Oh, now, wait a minute, Duke. This chassis has to go into the housing. The problem with that? The circuit is so intricate and untested, there's no telling what could happen. It could perform without a hitch and destroy the planet building, or it could go off while we're trying to put it together and destroy, well, you know. Boss, I got it. I got the answer. I know just the guy to do it, Mr. McTavish. He explains about his landlady, Mrs. Taylor, and how he happened to be looking through the window when he saw not only Mr. McTavish, but Superman. Now, you know something funny? When Superman gets near the professor's robot, he practically passes out on the floor. Now, let's take it slow, right from the beginning. Blade thought he already did that, but he'll go over it again while Lois and Jimmy are going over the whole story with Clark. Lois wants Clark to do something, but he's reticent to say the least. Lois gets fed up with his waffling and heads back to the professor's place by herself to see if there's a way to destroy the kryptonite. <laughs> Dear, dear Miss Lane, I do understand your request, but uh, if I take out the kryptonite, I might kill him. Unless taking the kryptonite out would erase all his memory banks and programming and all the rest, that's an exaggeration. Taking it out might deactivate him, but once you find another power source for him, you can activate him again and all is well. You do remember he's actually not alive, and as we saw, he can't even play the piano. <laughs> Here's the microphone, Duke. Right on this table. McTavish, don't let the gun... You can't just break in here like this. We already did, ladies. Yeah. This is the girl from the Daily Planet, Duke. They're wearing those masks, presumably to conceal their identities, and Blade is consistently calling his boss Duke. Someone may want to sit him down and explain all this to him in greater detail. They'll leave the professor there, because if he tells the police three men in masks broke in and stole his robot, well... But Lois is another matter. She gets to get kidnapped. Again. McTavish, follow me. You may have noticed that there's no cord, no antenna, nothing coming off that microphone that might link up with McTavish. That's because this was one of the earliest examples of a voice-changing microphone. It just poops the altered sound out the other end. We can't hear it because the microphone transmits it on a frequency that only Mr. McTavish and maybe Superman can hear. It's true. I read it on the internet. Hi, Professor Pepperwinkle. She was just terrible. You stay right there. I'll do something. You might like to know, Mr. Kent, that Miss Lane and Mr. McTavish have been stolen. What? What are you talking about? No, no, never you mind. You're too busy. I'll do something. Now, just a minute. No matter what you may be thinking, I haven't ignored this thing. In fact, I've already made arrangements to contact Superman myself. Superman flies over and frees the professor. Now they have to come up with a way to locate and rescue Lois. There's just one possibility. Yes, Professor. Uh, before I knew what it was, it gave off a very peculiar and odd sound on my Geiger counter. That's worth a try. You get that counter and I'll fly it all over the city if I have to. And then what? You can't get close enough to rescue anybody with McTavish around. Maybe one time during his sojourn on Earth he lets the authorities handle it. Besides, the Professor Geiger counter is too slow to respond. He'd be flying too fast for it to register. So they'll have to drive. Mechanical travel. Ugh. Oh, it's all my fault. I, I never should have built the tech. Now, Professor, everyone needs a friend. You're no different. I repeat, get a cat. Or a dog. 
take it from me and millions upon millions of other people, a pet will brighten your life like nothing else can. Pay a visit to your local pound and adopt an animal. As a bonus, they tend not to be radioactive, so even Superman can pet them. Sling! How did he get there? Look, this is perfect. Look, he's beginning already. Superman, get back. It might explode any second. The professor is out in the car and could just as easily come in here and free Lois, but we've discovered over the past six seasons that our Superman here has a bit of a superiority complex. We see it especially when he's in his Clark Kent persona, but he has it with both identities. He knows this stuff will kill him, but nobody else gets to be the hero. As King Solomon once said, pride often precedes a big takedown. While Superman falls unconscious to the floor, Duke has McTavish finish assembling the bomb, put it on the balloon, and send it on its way. McTavish, walk towards Superman. No, McTavish, it's me! Move away! Move away! I didn't count on him. McTavish, walk towards Superman. No, listen to me! Move away! Away! Toward him, McTavish! Toward him! Back, McTavish, back! McTavish grabbed his head, screamed in agony, shouted, I can't take this anymore, and ran out the door. He was never seen again. The professor eventually wins the shouting match. Superman stands up and runs away, and Pepperwinkle frees Lois. But that won't stop the bomb, which is on its way to the planet building, and more precisely Clark Kent's office, right now. Jeepers. What won't these advertising people think of next? What a crazy publicity stunt. Give me that, Jimmy. Jeepers now enormous. Neither Duke nor any of his henchmen realize that the super in super nitroglycerin means you can shake it around like that and it won't explode. How will we know when it happens? Uh, you'll know, gentlemen. I assure you, you'll know. The bomb! Get out of here! It'll go off any second! I'll get rid of it just as soon as I have your written and signed confessions. They're scrambling so fast to comply that confessions will be written and signed on things like scraps of paper, backs of receipts, and matchbook covers, but he'll have them. The bad guys are in jail, Superman took the bomb up in the air where it exploded harmlessly, and the professor figured out how to take the kryptonite out of Mr. McTavish. Uh, he's not strong anymore. He's just an ordinary robot. But he's still kind and gentle, and my friend. Well. But now he can cook. That seems like a good trade-off. And I'll bet he can play the piano now, too. Hey, friends, if you enjoyed the video, please click the thumbs up button and let me and YouTube know it. If you're not subscribed yet, you know what to do. And remember, you can become a patron of this channel for as little as $2 a month. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.